welcome to our time of worship this Sunday. I'd like to thank David for starting off with the time of music and praise. And now let us go to God's Word. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to your living Word, we ask that you speak to us in ways that we can understand, recognize and respond to. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits, for we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm happy to carry on in this series, in Moses' final sermons to his people in the book of Deuteronomy. Let me begin by asking you whether you identify with any of these statements. I'm happy when I have no family conflict. I'm happy when all my bills are paid. I feel relieved that my medical examination went well. I was able to help out a good friend today and I feel very satisfied. Well, finally, I was right, I was correct, and everybody knows it. I feel really good about that. Now, there are all kinds of things that make us feel good, aren't they? All these things, however, produce temporary results. I can have a good day, a great day, but I know in the back of my mind that tomorrow trouble may be just around the corner. We seek this thing and that thing, but in the end, what really matters? That is the question I have for you this morning. What really matters? Today we carry on in this series in Deuteronomy and we look at the whole concept of the glory of God. In the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy in verse 39, Moses exhorts the people, acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below, for there is no other. The glory of God is in absolute. There is no other. Now let me give you a little background to the context of my message today. In around chapters 33 and following, the Hebrews for months had sought things that made them feel good. This is in Exodus, sorry, not Deuteronomy. Yeah? For months they had sought things that made them feel good. Abundant food and water, safety and security, indulging in pagan revelry. Each time they found that the relief or happiness they received was only temporary. Now the Hebrews are again in crisis. For earlier in Exodus chapter 33, the people were informed that because of their sin of creating an imaginary God, the golden calf that we've all heard about, the presence of the Lord would no longer be with them. Suddenly they realize what life is all about. All priorities were off the table, all plans were set aside and they go into a time of mourning. For they realize a little too late that without the presence of God, they had lost their identity. They now realize that they had what they really wanted in the first place. They realize that without the Lord, all their striving is for nothing. And I think that is a lesson worth our heeding, don't you think? What is all our striving and our struggle for? People can survive without the presence of God, that is the honest truth. 
you can still raise a family, get an education, have a fulfilling and rewarding job, you can fall in love. There are many things that you can still enjoy without God. But it's still, it's worth our while to ask the question, in the end, what is it that really matters? And I would like to suggest to you today that what really matters in life is the presence of God. This is my conviction and my conclusion. I have over decades now seen so many lives beginning with my relatives, uncles, aunties, family, friends, and later on school friends, national service colleagues, and then members of my church and other people that I was called to be involved with in one way or the other in their lives. I think I have lived many lives vicariously. And that's my conclusion, that living without the presence of God renders most things almost redundant. You know, in the end, Jesus did warn us not to store up the things that are temporary, but rather to lay up treasures that are eternal. And I believe that this life is only a prelude to what is to come. It determines our position, our fulfillment, our reward in the life that is to come. It will make sense of all of our struggles, our tears, our sorrow, our pain when we are finally rewarded for being able to behold the full glory of God and not be consumed. We will understand His purposes and then we will receive that which is due to us according to what we have sown. Now, it would be fair to say that the glory of God is indescribable, for it is really everything and more. But for simplicity, one of the ways that we can understand the glory of God is to think of how God wanted His glory to be represented in the first place. And He did this by commanding that three items be placed in the ark. Let's look at these three items. The first item was manna. It was placed within a golden bowl and put inside of the ark. I believe he chose the manna to re represent Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. Because there's no greater testament to his capacity and his faithfulness in provision then in the way he brought forth manna every day for 40 years. And it reminds us that nothing exists without him. For his glory not only provides but it sustains. What do I mean by that? Remember, the manna seemed to have some kind of time mechanism in it. For five days, the manna lasted only 24 hours. And then on the Sabbath, they, they could collect it on, on Friday morning, it would have been, and Friday's manna would last through Saturday, the Sabbath, and then they could start again on Sunday, which was the first day of the week. So it had this remarkable time capacity. Five days, it would last 24 hours, and, for two, and on the fifth day, it would last for 48 hours. But here in the ark, there is another curiosity. The best that we know is the manna that was placed within the ark wasn't replaced for 365 days, because only once a year could Aaron go in there 
and uh, renew or, or, or check on these items or, or clean them. So I, I'm not even sure if the manor was replaced or not, but at best it would have been once a year. But the manor didn't rot, it didn't deteriorate, and it tells us of God's providing and sustaining presence. That's one aspect he wanted to remind us of, and he got the manner to be placed in the ark. The second item would have been Aaron's rod of authority. Remember, Aaron was given this rod because he felt he was inadequate, and then it was proven that he had the authority when the sorcerers of Egypt put their rods down, they, they were able to create serpents like him. But his serpent then went on to devour theirs. But the next curiosity that we have is we are told that within the ark, Aaron's rod kept blooming. Now we know that if you cut off a branch of a tree, it's not going to bloom anymore. Well, maybe there's some species you can cut it off, but you've got to put that in the ground or, or uh, attach it to some other tree or something, graft it. But a piece of wood standing on its own is not going to bloom. Certainly not for a long period of time. But that's exactly what happened with Aaron's rod. And I think it speaks to us that God's authority never ends. And also that his authority gives life, not death. The rod wasn't a rod used to punish and beat and kill and destroy. It was a rod that bloomed. What a wonderful picture when I reflect on it. It was a rod that bloomed and gave life. And, and I believe exactly that our lives blossom when we submit to his authority. That's so precious, I'll say that again. Our lives bloom or blossom when we submit to his authority. And thirdly, the Ten Commandments. So the manna was placed in a bowl in the ark, there was Aaron's rod and then the tablets on which the Ten Commandments were inscribed. These were placed within the ark. I believe the third item, the Ten Commandments, were there to remind us that the laws of God are glorious. The laws of God are good because they lead us to eternal glory. If we obey His commands, we blossom, we are fulfilled, and ultimately His commandments are what lead us to eternal glory. But if we think about these three items again, can you remember them? The manna, the rod, Aaron's rod, and the Ten Commandments. Do you realize what these items represent? They represent Jesus. As I started off saying earlier, the glory of God is indescribable. If you were to try and answer the question, what is the glory of God? It would be a challenge. Perhaps the better question would be, who is the glory of God? And that answer is Jesus. So can you see this wonderful blending, the coming together of this idea? The glory of God was represented by the Ark of the Covenant. Within the Ark, there were three items, the manna, Aaron's rod, and the Ten Commandments. And they were a foretelling of the very person of Jesus. Remember when Jesus came, what did he say? I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And on that last night, as we celebrated last week, he took the bread and he broke it. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, 
This is my body broken for you. So in the ark, it wasn't just the manner that God would provide for them. He would ultimately provide the body of His only beloved Son so that we may be partakers of His eternal glory. The second item was Aaron's rod of authority. Now, we are told, I'd like to read from Philippians 5, where it says, In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see? Aaron's rod was the forerunner of the authority that would come in the name of Jesus, at whose name every knee in heaven and below should bow to his authority. So, the manna spoke of his provision. He is the bread of life. The rod of Aaron pointed the way to the one whose name would be the ultimate authority. And finally, we see that with Jesus, he was the word. In the beginning was the word. And it's that word that facilitated the Ten Commandments. Without a vocabulary, without the original word, there wouldn't even be the Ten Commandments. So we have this almost mind-jogging, time-travel thing. The word was before the commandments. The commandments were given and it pointed the way to the word becoming flesh. Uh, these are threads and themes that are just too wonderful to comprehend. I, I, I was so blessed just in preparing this message. To, I was so excited to bring these concepts to you. That the glory of God is actually manifest in Jesus. But do you know what else is a part of that? And here's the great good news. The glory of God is not just in Jesus, it is in you and I. Because the final image is that the bridegroom is going to come and bring the bride for that final consummation. So just as much as Jesus is the glory of God, so are we. Wow, that is almost a thought too great to behold, to comprehend. But a great reminder that God created us for His glory and in part we are His glory. I remember singing a simple chorus, I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord because I can see in you the glory of my King and I love you with the love of the Lord. That is such a marvelous concept. Be encouraged in, in these times of trial and tribulation that whatever your struggle may be, 
no matter how sorely tested you may feel, be assured that God created you for His glory. He will provide for you. He will sustain you. And we will be taken to that place of final consummation when we can rejoice and dwell and bask in the glory of God. Be encouraged, my dear brothers and sisters. I want to thank each of you who are a part of BCF. We have been going through difficult and challenging journey. And yet, I have been encouraged by the fellowship, the opportunity we have to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to share in one another's lives. Let's continue to do that. And I believe that the God of all glory will continue to preserve and keep you in His presence. And let us take from today's lesson that ultimately what counts in life and we should cherish and hold on and wrestle and struggle to keep it all of our lives and that is the presence of God. Join me in a word of prayer. Loving, glorious and almighty God. We thank you for this truth that is revealed to us this morning. And truly we pray that you would keep us within your glory. Hold us in the glorious palm of your hands. That whatever this world brings our way, whatever challenges and disappointments and pain, assure us that you neither leave us nor forsake us, for we are a part of your glory now and forever by the authority given us in the blessed name of Jesus, whose body was broken and blood shed. To you be all glory and honor and praise, now and forever world without end. Amen. Have a great week in the presence and glory of God. Shalom.